Good morning, you're listening to FloorDaily.net, and I'm Kemp Parr. This morning, my guest is John Ball, the managing director with Stiefel Nicholas. John, how you doing? I'm doing great, Kemp. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you've just published a report that we're highlighting in our news today on Floor Daily, and thank you for granting me this little time to get into a few of the details. It's a 31-page report. There's no way we're going to be able to cover this in just a few minutes of this interview, but it's really well done. It's on LVT. Most people know who you are. We have discussions on a quarterly basis. You're a Wall Street analyst, and you cover the home furnishings sector And in our business, you track Mohawk and Armstrong and many of the retailers like Floor and Decor. So you keep your finger on the pulse of the business. It's kind of interesting that you even put some attention on this because there's furniture, there's mattresses, there's all kinds of things that you focus on. And the fact that you spent your summer vacation uh, (laughs) delving into this topic, it probably is one of the most newsworthy, coming out of nowhere type of topics. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and first of all, Kemp, thanks for your assistance and helping me with this project. Yeah, luxury vinyl tile is, is just taking uh, the floor covering industry by storm. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, you know, we did have growth of laminate several years back, and obviously uh, nuances in style and taste and consumer demand changes between products. But the speed at which this product has come on and the innovation within the product category, I think, are unprecedented. And, you know, quite honestly, it's causing a lot of disruption, as we like to say. And so we thought we needed to get into it and explore it a little bit. And, uh, again, thanks to your help and others, uh, hopefully we did that. Yeah. All right. So let's just a couple of highlights, and then we'll get into a couple of questions for you. You're telling us it's a $2.5 billion business. We say that 2.7. I think maybe the difference is some of these private label products that come in through distribution. We're pretty close there. Your growth rate, we agree with, 25 to 30 uh, percent. A point you bring out is that it's accounting for about 75 percent of the industry's growth. So it's where all the growth is today. That's a huge factor, really, that uh, you have a 10 percent, give or take, share of the industry taking 75, 80 percent of the growth of the industry. I, again, I don't remember a time when that's happened in any category within flooring. Obviously, carpet's been seeding share uh, slowly for a long period of time. I assume we'll continue to do so. But the only category we think that grew last year um, was ceramic, and clearly the growth rate of it slowed uh, significantly. So it's having implications for um, of manufacturers of all products as well as retailers. Yeah, one other topic that's interesting is where it's coming from. Over 50% of the LVT is coming from China. And in this instance, it's not one where they've taken something we've developed and they're making it cheaper. They, they actually have refined this product. Much of the development and innovation comes from them. I, I think that's a very good point, Kemp. It's something I learned in this homework assignment I had over the uh, summer vacation was, you know, that the innovation, much like, say, northern Italy is the innovation for ceramic, the innovation for LVT is coming out of China. Uh, China has a long history in making resilient flooring products. And for a variety of reasons, they have some technical and flexible advantages in making uh, LVT changing on the fly as innovations have come out. One of the questions I asked just about every constituent I talked with was where they thought we were on the innovation curve of LVT as a product. I got very different answers on that, but clearly everybody said it was coming out of China, most of the innovations, and I got some people who felt, and when I say where we are, not so much in terms of what's on a retailer floor in a sample today versus what can be technically be made today. And the answers varied a lot on where people felt we were on the innovation curve. But I think we're in the latter innings if I tried to take a consensus view of that, not in terms of production and in terms of getting it out in the field and and sampled and sold. We've got a long ways to go, I think, still on that front. But uh, tremendous innovation coming out of China and changes. And, yeah, the U.S. guys have been sort of caught flat-footed.
Mm-hmm. Actually, you've got some numbers around that. You, you're saying the domestic players make about 25% of what's consumed. And one of the points you make is, is that in China, they use a batch manufacturing process, whereas in this country, we like to run a continuous manufacturing process. And because- Well, we'd run, we'd run batch if we could, but uh, there's a problem with that. You've got to throw a lot of labor at it, and it's yeah. inefficient. So what the Chinese tend to do, and that's exactly what's happened here, is they tend to go capital light in terms of equipment, machinery, and labor heavy, because those are their their advantages. Here, we need to do the opposite. We need to invest heavily in capital and hopefully run these lines all day, all night, 24-7, 365. You know, quite honestly, in terms of SPC, which is the rigid product, there's no continuous lines that I could find around the globe that are that are running um, and a, making SPC on a continuous line basis. So the Chinese are making almost all of the SPC we consume right now, and they're doing it on this bad process. And we'll see if, if folks like Shaw and Mohawk can figure it out. Trust me, they're working on it. But that's where the Chinese are. That's where we are. And that's the central question facing the U.S. producers is can they make, uh, particularly SPC. All we're making right now that I can see is flexible. Flexible is easier to make on a continuous line. SPC has been more challenging. Mm-hmm. One question I want to ask you because I think you did a good job summarizing it. What are the growth drivers? Why is this taking off like it is? I think first and foremost I would cite the visuals. Secondly, the waterproof movement. And then, and then maybe thirdly, and these are hard to put in order of importance, the shortage of labor installation. All of these are contributing, in my mind, to the growth. Obviously, flooring is, is we want it to be a beautiful product we enjoy to walk on and look at. So visuals and texture and all these things that are done for advanced printing, beveled edges, sound improvements, which is still a little bit of a challenge, but I think improving. These are all important factors. But clearly there's a shortage of labor in, in installing. This is a significant factor. You know, products like ceramic tile, it takes a long time and a lot of labor to do that project and can be quite expensive all in. So significant advantages, and some of this has to do with the improved you know, locking systems or the thickness of the boards. We can do now more of the locking, floating floor type things so we get away from adhesives. But the bottom line is we can install it a lot faster, and, um, and that's a huge issue. The waterproof issue, that's a huge uh, advantage of LVT versus, say, laminate, which is still has that MDF core board. So, see, none of these factors, quite frankly, can slowing. Uh, there is a limit. Um, I think uh, there are certain consumers who always want a real wood floor or always want a real porcelain floor. And there are limits, as I said, to how much think future innovation there can be to the product relative to what we've come up with so far but there's still share shift coming yeah okay last question they've been talking in washington about these tariffs Uh, what impact do you think tariffs might have on this business tariffs is a real hot button issue a lot of passion around this subject i won't get into the whole broader issue whether tariffs are good for the u.s economy or bad obviously trump wants something out of china and he's gonna uh, he's probably gonna get it whether it ultimately becomes say a 10 percent tariff or a 25 percent those are big deals for one versus the other i think 10 percent is manageable we've already seen the one depreciate there's a way for each constituent along the way to take a little bit of the hit, if you will, and, and not really alter the, the price of the product. If we get 25%, that changes the game. Remember, it's not just LVT. We've got other flooring products from China, engineered wood uh, floors, for example, that are in this bucket. So really what it would do, it would raise the price uh, for flooring coming out of China. And we estimated the flooring China. China accounts for somewhere around 15, 16% of all flooring consumption in the U.S. So, you know, it's going to have, it's going to inflate that price if we got 25%. You could argue that it would help some of the more domestically based manufacturers and or those companies that are importing product from, say, South Korea as opposed to China. But wow, it could be a negotiating ploy. Trump backs off. 
certainly could back off 25%. It might be 10%. We'll stop talking about this, or it might be nothing. We'll see. Um, I'm not that concerned about it, but every day that goes by and Trump talks tougher, yeah, you have to have a plan B, and uh, you have to worry about it. Well, you know, with all flooring categories, there's other capacities. You know, you got ceramic you mentioned. You know, it'll just shift. If if there's a 25% tariff, it'll shift to another country or shift to domestic. Uh, Same with uh, engineered hardwood. But with LVT, at this point right now, it's just going to be a tax on consumers because there's no capacity.